Count me in. All right. Hello, everyone out there. It's Jeff Thurman from Home Renovation DIY. And in this live show today, we are going to talk about everything that the big box stores don't want you to know about the industry and about how it is that they are, how should we say, concealing some obvious truth from you as far as it relates to the quality of the products that they're selling and the price that they're selling at and what your alternatives are to them. They've done a masterful job marketing themselves over the last couple of decades as the only option for homeowners. And the truth is, whew, the tide is turning. Industry is changing a lot, and there are a lot of new options out there for you guys for getting better product, better value, better pricing, better information, better service, better everything. And so we're going to talk about in today's videos, where should you be shopping? What are the benefits of switching up your traditional Oh, I'm, I'm team blue, I'm team orange, or team green, or team red, or whatever it is, right? What are the different options for homeowners? Because, well, let's just face it. You're the last thing that anybody in the world is thinking about when it comes to marketing their product. No more Clark Kent. It's time to go Superman. Let's dive into this. So, here's the deal. Um... There is one primary goal that every manufacturer of every product in the, in the building industry has, and that is not to sell to you. It's to sell to the builders, the renovation contractors, the remodelers. They don't give a rip about you. Okay, They don't start off their business meeting even thinking about any of you, the homeowner, because you're an individual and you're easily manipulated. Yeah, it sucks to hear, right? Because a lot of you are very intelligent people, very successful. You have beautiful homes and you're just like, hey, Jeff, I just want to renovate my basement. It seems like a fun project. I'm a smart guy. I'm, I'm, I'm physically fit. I can do this myself. And I don't need to invite strangers into my home. The wife and I and the kids would love to have a little family project. This sounds like a great idea. Here's the deal. You're going to overpay on that project 50 to 80, 100 percent more than you need to. But in today's video, we're going to cut through all of the BS. We're going to teach you how to get great value for your buck. <sighs> Let me say this again. The primary goal of every manufacturer has nothing with you in mind. They want to sell to a builder, a renovator, a contractor. Because if they can get you get a contractor on board or a builder on board, and they can say, hey, our system is the best system. You can use our system, and it'll make you money. It's efficient. We're going to train your team. Okay, which is a big thing because the systems need training. Then you can go out and say, now I'm going to be this system oriented. You can market that system to your clientele. Okay. And then you can be efficient and you can be uh, effective and you can be knowledgeable about a product as a construction worker. But then when it comes to the homeowner, you get the leftovers. Like that's just the way it works. Like when you go to a trade show, a couple weeks ago, I was in Vegas, trade show, okay? Um, thousands of manufacturers out there. Not one of them was talking to homeowners. And not one of them is going to be at your local community home and garden show this spring or next fall. They are not going to be there. What they're going to have is all of the construction companies from your neighborhood who have been indoctrinated and trained on their product, representing the product for them to you, the homeowner. And not only are you going to have to go and listen to all of these companies tell you what their product is and why they're better, they're going to say, I'm going to supply it and install it. You sit back and get out of my way because that's our business model. So if you're a DIYer and you want to install a quality product and you don't want to have to pay two or three times more than you should, where do you go? And that's what this is all about today. Let's talk about where to shop as a DIYer and get contractor pricing. You can get it. The market's changing. I'm going to give you all the details. But first, I want to let you in a little another secret. There's no such thing as a traditional three-bed, two-bath home. Everything is different. Every real estate market across country, coast to coast, is regional, right? So California, New York, Florida, northern Alabama, middle of somewhere, Colorado, okay? You all have different markets. Now, um, I'm going to get a little bit of assistance here. We're going to move the camera over, and I'm going to show you a little price point. And this is going to be a little demonstration just to give you an understanding of what it is that's going on in the marketplace as far as product quality is concerned. Because 
it's different with cars, okay? We sell a lot of different cars. So if you want to go from A to B, we're going to sell you a cheap car, and we're going to sell you an expensive car. We're going to give you all the different bells and whistles, different sizes. Oh, you got kids. You don't have kids. Oh, yeah. You know, you got to compensate. You need a sports car. All different options, right? But here in housing, it's different because we're using square footage as a model. We're using three bed, two bath as a model. You'd think that the same house built in the same, in, in one city would be the same price as it is in another city, but it isn't. Because supply and demand, the workforce, the taxation, all the different government policies, everything comes into play. So let's take a look at this. Right here. We got a hundred thousand dollar house, two hundred thousand dollar house, four hundred, five hundred, eight hundred million, three bed, two bath. Now, depending on who you are, it's really difficult now because we've increased the the, the confusion factor of what product is right for you right? So first of all, shout out to everybody who's living in a three bed, two bath, and you're looking to renovate. Here's where the confusion begins because the, the box stores traditionally deal with this market here up to the half million. This is where they specialize. Okay. They don't sell products to homeowners who are living in 800 or a million or a million five or, you know, 14 bed, 17 bathroom, 20 acres. Uh, I, they don't sell that market. So Right away, right out of the gate, you've been eliminated as a homeowner from buying quality products for your house. And if you've been a fan of this channel for a while, you know what I say. If you're going to DIY it, buy quality, right? Because 20% of the cost of a renovation is material. The other 80% is labor and taxes. And you've eliminated that by getting involved. So why the heck wouldn't you put in quality product so that you can change the valuation of your home from a two to a 400,000 over the next few years? Don't forget that when you do that, when you sell that house, that extra money you made, that 200,000, yeah, most places there's no income tax on that, right? So you can make an extra 200,000 after tax. That is money in the bank. And that is why we do this. It is the oldest secret in the book is to buy an asset increase its value and then sell it and not have to pay tax. That's why the law was written like that. It's for rich people to get richer, but every homeowner has the ability to do this. So you're going to be stuck in a market where the box store is saying, okay, so up until a certain threshold, we're going to supply products to that price point. Okay. What about everybody else? Because what do you say? The paint store is selling paint to paint this house. The paint store is also selling paint to paint this house out of the same store. So what's the deal? They have seven different lines. Yep, they do. Home Depot, Lowe's, other stores, they don't have seven lines. They got three or four because they're focused on a smaller market of people that are almost forced into doing it themselves because they can't afford a contractor. All right. And that group of people is getting bigger and bigger every year. And the number of contractors is shrinking every year. So you need to understand the conditions of the marketplace are dictating that they're selling to the bottom half of the income earners with a bottom of their barrel product and still trying to make a fortune. Now keep that in mind. Let's get back to my notes. <clears throat> okay. I don't got quite a presentation today. Before we go any further, let's just do a shout out everybody out here. Thanks for joining us today, guys. If you're a member of the channel, Great to see you here again. Uh, we appreciate all your love and supporting us as we're growing this YouTube channel. Things are changing this year. We're going to be doing a lot more live shows. I think it's going to be exciting. Uh, we've got to keep up to date and build this community. It's going to be really important. There's a lot of really things going on out there that are just blowing my mind. And I'm going to bring a lot of it to you today. But first of all, if you're watching this, sh uh, watching this video and you're not a member, what are you missing out on? You're missing out on an opportunity to get your questions answered. You're missing out on the community. You're missing out on our forum where you can post pictures and get uh, professional advice about your situation, right? Because I, I don't have any skin in the game. So I'm just going to tell you the brass truth. I mean, that's all there is to it. I have nothing to hide. So if you got questions, you want an answer, and you don't want someone trying to sell you a product, I'm your guy. Um, cheers. Sandy Rose is in the house. Welcome back, Sandy. Mary's in the house. Great to see you guys. Uh, Existential Paints here again. Now, this is my community, right? You, you are my people. I just love you all. Listen, here, let's get into this. Um, I've got a little bit of a, uh, a presentation. We're going to get into Q&A again later for sure, but I wanted to share this because I said last week, 
or is it last week or two weeks ago? Two weeks ago. I said, I'm going to share with you where you should shop. Okay. And it's not so simple because the answer to where you should shop is not, how shall we say, um, a national distributor. It's not a national brand. You're going to have to learn how to step out of your comfort zone a little bit if you want to save a lot of money and get better product. But we're going to explain today what's going on in the marketplace, what that all means, what it looks like, and how you can be successful doing it. Okay. So here we go. Um, first of all, the goal here is to help teach homeowners how and why they should shop where the contractors shop, okay? And this is very important. Uh, historically, yeah. we've already talked about everybody's marketing to the contractors, right? And and then they come up with these designer products. HTTV is wonderful for this. They show, oh, the beautiful million dollar kitchen and the designer this, the designer that, and they create this fake atmosphere TV shows show these wonderful lifestyles of people that are living in million dollar homes with average jobs. It's just, it's not fair to all the rest of us because it leaves you very confused. What we're going to do is we're going to draw an analogy today because this is very important. I was thinking about this the other day. I was like, how do I get this thought through? Because we know that a paint company will sell seven different lines of paint. It's basically the same paint with different additives, with different performance, with different um uh workability right so the more money you spend the better quality you get the better performance you get the better coverage you get the better stain protection you get the better whatever but it really comes down to just a few major points in the world of paint um you get water and you get solids and then you get technology and you put those three together in different mixtures and you can get a 15 or 150 dollar paint okay that's basically how it works. So what I want you to look at building materials for the eyes of food. Okay. And uh, you're going to answer this question and shout it out. Let me know how many people are out there comparing when they go shop for renovation materials, you're going to the big box stores, right? And here they all have the same thing in common. McDonald's and Burger King. Where do you find them? On the main street, right? The most prevalent neighborhood part of town. Okay. Where all the traffic is. That's where the big box stores are. It's the most expensive real estate out there. Okay. They spend a fortune on advertising and marketing, just like the big box stores do, right? And then they deliver one of the cheapest products on the market. But the majority of people go there because it's convenient, because they're already driving by. And that's how I want to think about your shopping habits when it comes to buying building material. You're buying from McDonald's and Burger King. Now think about this for a second. Wait a minute. My home is worth a half a million dollars. What am I doing buying my building materials at McDonald's and Burger King? Maybe you should up your game a little bit, all right? And answer this in the comment section. Um, what do you prefer, Subway or Chipotle? Because, <laughs> you know, a good sandwich with some fresh ingredients is better than McDonald's and Burger King any day of the week. They can't argue that, <clears throat> right? We're still dealing with, you know, Chipotle, but it's better, isn't it, as an option? And wouldn't you put that in your home versus McDonald's or Burger King? Like, do you want to go through all the trouble of taking out the furniture and ripping up an old floor just to put down Big Mac all over your floor? Or do you think you want to put down maybe like a Southwest chicken sub? Maybe that's a better option. Like, think about it, right? Now, let's go to the next step. <clears throat> maybe instead of a quick walk through sandwich place we're going to get some service we're going to go sit down and we're going to get some service at the table we're talking tgif or red lobster Woo! -hoo! we're really going all in there kids now instead of 20 bucks for dinner for burger king meal we're going to go 30 bucks for service and maybe even leave a tip well hot damn aren't we living now but if you're in a three to five hundred thousand dollar home <sighs> big mac ain't gonna cut it you're going to lose value when you go to sell that thing. They're going to walk in. They're going to smell the special sauce. It's going to be obvious. It's going to be like every other flip with the special sauce all over the floor. And they're going to be like, I don't want this house. It's, it's not worth what you're asking for it. Now, if they saw a surf and turf all over the floor, they'd be like, hey, now that's my place. There's some value there. You understand? I'm just working on your thinking process here. Now... <clears throat> 
there's another elevation. Because one thing all those restaurants have in common is everyone who's making that food, none of them are chefs. Okay? And we've all watched the shows. We watch the chefs. We're, we're following the food channel. We're learning how to grill at our own place. We're doing cookouts with the neighbors. We're making our own food. We, if, you, if you pay attention, you can learn how to cook quite, a, quite an awesome meal on your own. And you don't want nothing to do with any of those restaurants after a while because you can do a better job of yourself. Well, that's what DIY is, doing it yourself. Because you don't want no cookie cutter meal as far as a renovation. You want a chef. You want chef quality in your home. You want the Gordon Ramsay or the Bobby Flay or the, or the Wolfgang Puck. That's the experience you're looking for, right? Without the price tag. And you can get it. I've been preaching for years. If you do it yourself, 20% of the cost is materials. And if you're crazy, you'll buy nice stuff and go 30% for material. And you'll get a return on the investment. That'll blow your mind. You know, um, that basement series that we just finished doing, someone asked me a question in the comment the other day. They said, how many hours did you put in? I was like, I hadn't even thought about it. So I sat back, I looked at the schedule, did the math. We saved $80,000 renovating that basement. But we did it in an amount of time that made me $220 an hour. After tax, because you're investing in your own house. Who out there is making $200 an hour after tax? Think about it. I'm not just talking about, oh, you can't find a contractor, maybe I should DIY. I'm letting you know that in today's world, with the access to information, and the membership and my help, I'm here to help you out. We're going to turn you guys into culinary experts as it relates to home improvement. You're going to be able to make your own stuff, have success, increase the asset value of your home, make a ton of money that the government can't touch. Yeah. And if you start soon, if you're 25 years old and you're watching this right now and you say, I don't know, I can't get into the housing market. Don't lie to yourself, okay? Go buy yourself a $30,000 piece of junk from 1940. And then over the next three years, you fix it up, you sell it for 120. And then you turn that money over and then you buy yourself a three bedroom, two bathroom for 200,000. That's 1960 original condition. The kitchen's a god awful atrocious mess. There's four by four inch tiles all over the bathrooms. But you know what? Fixtures and finishes. You can remodel that thing over the next three to five years. Boom, it's worth four to 500. I'm telling you right now, you can create a whole nest egg of tax-free revenue and by the time you're 55 you'll be like well hell now i own multiple houses i've got assets i've got cash flow you know you're living large don't be like the rest of us suckers who took a job and spent our whole life just to pay off the mortgage right there's a whole other world of opportunity out there if you're li willing to live in the chaos there's unlimited opportunity Okay, what I'm saying is if you live in the dirt, you're going to DIY it, you can have major success. And let's just say this before we go any further. The time's coming, guys, where the world's changing. There's going to be two people on this planet, people who own and people who don't. And the ones who own are going to write their own ticket. And everyone who doesn't is going to be subjected to all kinds of tyranny. And we know it's coming. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to see it. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know when it's going to happen. I just know this. If you don't own your own house in this foreseeable future, you are going to be subjected to all kinds of tyranny. And that's the end of the discussion. So get into the market, buy your first house. If it's unaffordable, move to a different state, hook up your internet, start your business there. You're not, you don't, you're not stuck where you are. hundred years ago, people would go and, and, and leave their family months at a time to go work in the logging industry or work in a mine somewhere. All of a sudden we're so entitled. We don't even want to, pick up our stakes and move to a different state and plug in the same internet to run our business because it's so far from mom that we only saw once a month anyway. Listen, it's time to make, change the way we're thinking. Now, where to shop? Let's get down to the good stuff, right? This is where it gets fun. <sighs> Here's some principles that I want you to pay attention to, okay? Um, you get what you pay for. Every business is going to turn a profit one way or another. They're either going to give you, um, they're going to sell a lot of volume with, with small margin. Or they're going to sell a little bit of volume with huge margin and low value. Okay, so you get what you pay for. Overhead's really the key. Okay, whenever you see a business that's got uh, the McDonald's location, the most premier corner, right up there, the lights, highway to highway, you know. 
That's the most expensive real estate in town. I'm going to guarantee you, whenever you see something that's the most expensive real estate in town, you're not getting value in your construction material because the builders and the, and the contractors aren't shopping there. That's just the way it works. Okay. Um, if you've never heard of a company before, it's because they're not advertising because they don't need to, which means they're not charging an increase. Of, they're not a surplus charge just to pay for their advertising budget. So let's say you're going to go out and buy a can of paint. It's worth 20 bucks. Oh, don't forget you're on the main street. You got rent and that parking lot that, 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 that parks 8,000 cars that no one ever uses. Yeah, that costs money, right? That's millions of dollars to keep that asphalt paved. Now your paint's already 40 bucks. And then you got a hundred people walking around who are staff and air conditioning. And oh, don't forget advertising and sales and marketing. Well, wow, now the can of paint is $65 a gallon. Wow. <clears throat> well, how do I turn my $20 can of paint into only 12 bucks? Because that's all I can really afford to buy it for if I'm selling it at 65. Well, that's no problem. I'm just going to sell a cheaper version of the same paint and we're going to market it as sexy. Okay. Yeah. God bless you. Right. What's that old thing at one o'clock in the morning after everybody's had a bunch of drinks and the lights are down, everything's sexy. You don't want to buy that can of paint. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> Listen, um, if they're advertising, it means they're selling you junk. There's a whole lot of money wasted on advertising. It's not necessary. And if you got to pay somebody else to tell you where you should shop, you're already buying junk. Now, Wholesale is dead. Here's a new rule. It used to be you'd have a manufacturer, you get a distributor ship, they sell it to a wholesaler, they sell it to a retailer. They'd spend all kinds of money saying, hey, go buy this product over here and the doors are open and here's our address. We're on the main street. You can't miss us. Boom, you go in there and you buy junk and you go out happy because you're used to comparing Big Macs and Whoppers. And you don't know that there's an option. You don't know that you can get steak and seafood. You don't know that you can, for a few bucks, you can learn how to be your own chef. So <clears throat> let's go through the formula. The cost of the product plus the location plus the labor plus the marketing and advertising, the higher all of those things are, the lower the value you're getting in that store. All right. Does that make sense? Is that, is that, does that make sense? Is that obvious? And there's, there's, there's alternatives, which is what we're going to get to now. Okay. So, um, never sticker shop. You're going to be disappointed. I did that today just for fun. I walked into a couple of different box stores and a local retailer uh, who's also a wholesaler, which is strange because some businesses out there actually have a wholesale and retail model in the same store. Blows your mind. But then I compared. I said, okay, so they got five different product lines. Like I said, the 100 to the 500. They've got those five different product lines. And they, they use really fancy names and really fancy labels. And they try to make it look all sexy and nightclub-like, you know, diamonds and glitter and gold. And it's, it's fun. It, it's paint, for God's sake. The point is this. The cheap stuff was 25 to 30 bucks a gallon. And the expensive stuff was 65 But that expensive stuff is still the cheap stuff when you go to an actual paint store. But in the paint store, the expensive stuff is marketed at $90 to $100. And if you don't know how to negotiate a better price, you think that, well, the paint store is for the millionaires. But the reality is that the paint contractors are going to that store. And they're getting almost 50% off because they open an account. Because they're running a business. Think about that. Every product you do starts and ends with paint. You have to prime something, you got to finish something. And all you need to do to open up an account at a paint store is use the same information that you used to open up a Google account. Name, address, telephone number, email. That's it. Set up a paint store account. You can get a great deal. I'm telling you this because I've told you this before and no one ever did it. And I don't know why. Maybe you all thought that I was crazy. Maybe it was just too easy back in the old days when I gave you this advice the last time. Life was good. Everybody's making money. You know, the, the economy was all soaring. Everything was peaches and cream, and we didn't have to worry about our money. But now we sure as hell got to worry about our money, don't we? We see the writing on the wall. There's a lot of, lot of scary stuff going on out there. Oh, did I? I saved that. That was close. All right.
No one should compare apples to oranges. Don't confuse marketing for quality, okay? So what do we do as homeowners now? Homeowners, you're one. You're, you're an individual when you go shopping. Don't forget, you're not part of a buying group. You're just, you're just yourself. What do you do? Where do you go? Well, use the Google machine. <laughs> Type in whatever you're looking for. For instance, um, how many know, uh, hands up, you've been to Home Depot or Lowe's or another box store and you've seen the map hay line on the, you know, they've got the Caracolor or the Ultra Color, the grout products, and maybe a couple of cement products, and they're all there on the floor, right? Okay. Did you know that that's twice the cost of every floor distributing company that's two blocks down the street and around the corner that you don't know about? Like, that's just the way it works. So if they're selling for 30, you can get it for 15, three blocks away. Okay. Um, millwork. Oh, baseboards and casing. Great example, right? That takes a lot of labor because what they do is they deliver that stuff off a truck. They put it on their orange cart. They drive it to the other end of the store. And then they pay these guys to pick it up one button at a time and stand it on the wall. And they, they line it up according to the display. And they do this every day. They Incredibly labor intensive, right? But then the same delivery truck drives across the street and around the corner to a millwork supply shop who sells to contractors, has the same product in that and they sell that at half price at the millwork shop because the rent's dirt cheap. They're not advertising. And the only people who go there are contractors. And then you got to ask yourself, well, where do these contractors come from? And how do they all know to go there? Well, here's the easy answer. In the contracting business, every time you hire somebody, generally speaking, the average hire of a contractor is six months, maybe a year tops. Okay. And during that six months to a year, they're learning the following things how they sell, how they price, where they shop, what their process is, how much money they're making. And as soon as they figure out your business model, they leave to start their own company. And what they do is they go back to all the same stores that you shopped at and they open up their little cash account or credit account at the same place. So these places don't have to advertise. It's all built right in, okay? Every time a contractor dies, he's created 20 more customers for that same store in the course of his business. It's just normal. Now, as a homeowner, what you need to do is, is go, okay, so how do I identify this without getting a job as a contractor? And we, we really are going to just take a minute here to address the fact that we're getting some love on the screen. Let's just deal with this. Um, <laughs> we're, getting, we're getting some tips. We're getting new members. Vitality, no questions today. All the answers are in the videos. Three years ago, I convinced him to tear down his first bathroom. It was scary. Now he's confident in what he's doing. Looking forward to do some structure changes with an engineering stamp. You know what? The funny thing is, is when you're doing changes with an engineering stamp, it's not that tricky because now you've got a professional who's going to give you the process and the drawings and he can walk you right through it. Like, it's not that hard. I've been telling you for years, look at the kind of people that are working on the renovation business. And then you tell me if you think you can um, match them mentally. Not a doubt. Not a doubt. Uh, he's living in Oakville, Toronto area. Nice. So he's got a reno superstore up there called Winka Building, right? And he goes to Sherman Williams for paint. He's got an account. Good for him. 40% off everything. Yeah. Ikea for kitchen and built in. There you go. Nice. All right. So let's go talk about this. Where should we shop? And then we're going to talk about the, the process real quick. And then we're going to dive into some questions. If you've got questions about shopping or materials or pricing or what's good, what's bad, what's ugly, I'll be happy to answer it. Um, I'm not on the payroll yet. So nobody's paying me to have an opinion. It's one of the benefits you get here. And uh, uh, if I have any knowledge that can help steer you along the way, I'm going to do it. Hmm. All right. So here we go. That's a great story. Thanks for sharing that, bud. I'm glad to hear you're doing so well. And you know what? Here he is. He's like, is that three $20 tips in a row? And he's, he's laughing all the way, all the way to the bank, because he probably made himself 12 or 15 or $20,000 on the bathroom alone. And all the power to him. That's why we do this. Uh, I told uh, my son the other day. I said, if 25% of the people that watch our videos actually go out and do any renovation project at all in their house, at all, and they earn $1,000 worth of asset in their, in their home, last year alone, we helped homeowners earn over $100 billion. Think about it. <laughs> Blew my mind when I sat there and thought about it. I was like, you think 25% you think of people actually do paint something or change a floor or fix something? I'm like, yeah, why the hell else would they be here? So that's awesome. 
Yeah. Okay. Sorry. He's up 150,000 last year. <laughs> he is laughing all the way to the bank. Right on. And cheers to if you're joining the membership. This is awesome, guys. All right. Let's talk about quick. Where do we shop? All right. <clears throat> First of all, um, I want you to go. Let's do a Google search. If you're watching the show right now on your near computer, do a Google search. Okay. And if you're not sure, watch this video again. We're going to re-release it um, probably in a week or two. I want you to, because we like to edit it down and make it more comprehensive, but I want you to Google right now, um, pick something, flooring, okay? Flooring wholesalers near me. There we go. Flooring wholesalers near me, all right? And you're going to do that, and and let's see what we get. You're going to pull this up on the screen for me. This is awesome. We'll give you an example. Because there's a few key things that you got to learn here about searching out a wholesaler. Flooring wholesaler near me. Wholesaler is a big key. Go past the ads. Boom, boom, boom. All right. Um, okay. So here's a company. I'm I'm down here in Florida right now, so I'm just cheating. Uh, flooring Pro Source of Orlando. I have no idea who this is. Can we click on that? Because Google will give you a, a landing page. It's going to give you a website option or something, right? They're going to find out what's the hours of operation. Well, these people even have a showroom. Okay, they're open eight to five. That's probably retail. You back out. And what you do is you keep on searching until you find someone that opens up at six or seven o'clock in the morning. Okay, that's the secret. Wholesalers don't open up at eight or nine. They open up at six or seven. Because that's when the contractors are picking up the materials so they can show up at the job for 8 o'clock. All right? So if you do a Google search and you find a store that opens up at 6 or 7, chances are they're a wholesaler. That's all I'm saying. They probably close at 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. They're not open in the evenings. They're not open on weekends. Maybe they'll do a half-day Saturday. But that's traditionally the business model that you're looking for. So you can go flooring wholesale. You can go um, millwork. Okay, you can go find a place that sells doors and trim. All right. Um, if you're in a, in a rural area, you're going to be a little bit out of luck. You got to go find that major city next to you. Okay. Because um, builders and contractors generally only work on wholesale in larger districts. So you got to have at least about a 30 to 50,000 population in one city, and there'll be somebody there. For instance, um, I'm down in Florida right now in the Lake County area, and there's a company here called Romac. And if you're not from the local area, you've never heard of these guys. They don't advertise, right? They're, they're, they're not sponsoring ball teams all over town. They're not on the news. They're not on radio and TV. They don't have billboards. They got, they got some stores in a kind of somewhat seedy part of town. It's old commercial industrial area. And you know what? It works great for them because the cost is low. And they've got great staff. And they know what the hell they're doing. And they do everything from trusses to doors and windows and everything else. They've got massive business going on. They got drive-through lumber pickup. Like back in the old day when you didn't have to get out of your car to get your lumber, you just drove through the lumber yard and they'd throw it in your truck for you. Whoa, ha, it's a miracle. It's 1970 again. This kind of stuff exists. But all you got to do is you got to just go make one switch. Switch off the brain, off the advertising and the marketing. And every time you see marketing and advertising go, this is evil. This is counterproductive to me being successful. Okay? Use Google. For the first time in history, you've got access to somebody who's going to tell you how to do the job. You've got access to all the information as to everybody in business in your city. And all you got to do is go find them, make a quick call and say, hey, can I buy direct from you? I'm a homeowner. Here's the thing. And I'm going to blow your mind with this. The last couple of years during all this COVID mess, the companies, the number one challenge they had was getting product. Supply chain, right? Sales are doubling all over the place because the housing boom, everything's doubling. Everybody's renovating. Everybody's flipping. Interest rates are low. The whole world's going crazy in re real estate. Oh, quick, we got to buy our new house. We got to fix it up. We, gotta, we can't travel. Let's fix up the house. So everybody's selling everything like mad dogs, okay? And, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to just, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go here, but let's assume for example, that a flooring company has manufactured 2 billion square feet of a laminate floor. Last year, they sold it all and installed it all. But don't forget their business model is not to sell to you. It's to sell to contractors and flooring companies and, 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 and installers. 
And so they made two billion, they installed and sold two billion. This year, the biggest challenge they have is they made another $2 billion, two billion square feet of flooring, but they've only got enough staff and contractors to install one and a half billion square feet. So they got warehousing and inventory issues. They're panicking because they don't have enough guys to install the flooring this year. And so now they're like, well, where do we go? <laughs> they're going to you. They're opening up the floodgates. So now the wholesalers are saying, yeah, we'll sell to you, the homeowner. Because we're motivated because we got inventory. We can't get rid of this stuff. This is a good problem to have. I was at the trade show. And the people that are in charge of training people are panicking this year because they don't have enough people. They don't have bodies on the ground. So if you're a homeowner and you're looking to take advantage of the market, forget all the naysayers. Forget all the doom and gloom. Forget all the oh, housing's going to crash. Everything's going to. The it's all a bunch of BS. Okay. They're just distracting you. They're playing a shell game. Bottom line is, if you own a home, don't sell it and move right now. The mortgage rates are nuts. Re renovate it. Remodel it. Turn your three to a 400. Turn your four to a five. Turn your five to an eight. Now's the time because you can get wholesale pricing on materials. You can get expert tutorials, right? If you want to learn how to do plumbing even better than I do, because I'm not a master plumber. There's a guy on YouTube called Roger Wakefield. I met him at the trade show. Great guy, just like he seems on YouTube. He knows plumbing. He's a bloody plumber. Get on YouTube. Learn how to do stuff. You, you're more than capable. I'm telling you right now, you watch 10 videos from Roger Wakefield, you'll learn more than an apprentice plumber on a job site in three weeks because they barely even talk to that kid. They just say, go to the corner and connect all the stuff. Like, if you're here, you should know what you're doing already. <laughs> They're brutal. But the point is this. Wholesalers are now selling to retail. They're selling right out of their wholesale store. And it's a little different. You know, you're going to roll up. You're going to be like, is this the place? Google Maps is going to take you there. They're not going to have a fancy sign. It's not going to be a fancy parking lot. There's not going to be no, you know, like a cart stall area where you push your cart when you're done shopping. Right? It's just going to be a roll up garage door or maybe a little man door on the side of a building out of nowhere. And what you're going to do is you're going to walk in there and it's going to be dark. It's not well lit. It's going to be a little chaotic. It's going to be confusing. What you're looking for is a counter. And there'll be some guy sitting behind that counter. And a lot of times they got a 45 pound ashtray there and a great big stogie going, right? And, then, and they got a computer that looks like it's like from 1975. And they're like, uh, they're not saying hello, welcome. Can I get you anything? Would you like, can I get you a coffee? They're just sitting there minding their own business. And they're waiting for the next guy to walk up to that counter who knows what the hell they want and ask for it. And if you stand there looking confused, someone's going to walk right in front of you, put stuff on the counter. They're going to make their purchase and leave because they're contractors and they're in a hurry. But in that environment, you can go and buy them at pay at a flooring wholesaler. I'm telling you right now, there's products on the floor in those places that are $15 a bag for Thinset. And you're going to a box store to pay 45 to 60 bucks for the same stuff. Because you're paying for a parking lot and people running around in aprons telling you it's an aisle eight and lots of lighting and customer service and lots of advertising. And it means nothing to you because you've already know what you want because you've got your training. Don't waste your time and energy. All right. I've been ranting for like 40 minutes on this. This is incredible. I'm going to get a drink because I'm running out of running out of throat. <laughs> Guys, let me just say, um, where, where are we? Let's, let's go back here a little bit. Welcome Eugene. And, um, what was that? There's a, another comment there. We're just working on this. I've got a great big screen TV in front of me, so I don't have to wear my eyes to read comments. Okay. Uh, we're going to go answer some questions now. And if, and if you're not sure, if that was a little overwhelming or you got questions about the supply chain, where you should go to shop, hit me up with your specifics. So see what I can do to help. But let me just run through this quick list. There are um, places where you can go to buy windows, places you can go to buy interior doors, trim work, flooring, flooring installation supplies, um, tile, um, exterior facade, like siding and cement fiberboard, even roofing materials you can get as a contractor price. Um, uh, lumber material for sure. It's not the greatest market. Drywall, yes, but all depends. But most of these major purchases, you can get you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% off. You don't have to pay retail. 
right? And they'll deliver to the house. And in a lot of cases, it's free, like plumbing fixtures, for Pete's sake. I, I, I shop at Wolseley in Ontario. Wolseley, Canada, coast to coast. Distribution centers all over the place. They can have everything delivered to you within 48 hours in most cases, all right? And they'll deliver to the job site. I don't have to go back a second time and pick it up. There's no fee for the delivery. That's how much product they sell to contractors. They're constantly driving. They got one guy who drives around all day long in circles dropping stuff off, okay? You don't have to pay for delivery with these people. They've got national distribution services, right? It's just amazing. Okay. <laughs> how much prep should you have before walking up to the counter? Like, should I ask for brands or just be like, I need X pounds of thin set? Well, you know, that's a great question. And, and to be honest with you, the more specific the, the situation, the more difficult it is. But listen to this. This is the key. The guy working behind the counter has been told by his boss, sell to a homeowner. And they can smell you from a mile away because you smell clean, right? You're wearing clean clothes in most cases. They know you're a homeowner. They're not surprised to see you there. What you say is, this is what I'm doing. What's the right thin set in your store from my application? Because there's more than one manufacturer. And there's all kinds of different brands. And they, they'll they carry different lines depending on who they're in bed with, right? So let's say you're going to, oh, you walk up. Classic example. I'm, I'm just installing a 12 by 24 tile on a wooden subfloor. Which thin set do I need for that? And they'll, they'll sell it to you. If it's on concrete, it's a different product. If it's a tile, it's a different size, it's a different product. They're going to ask you, is it ceramic or rectified porcelain? It's a different product. Are you using a, a, an uncoupling membrane or not? Different product. Well, did you use the primer? Are you using a crack isolation membrane? They're, they are so educated about what they're selling. They're like an encyclopedia behind that desk. They know the products. They've been trained on everything. The sales reps come in. They do training seminars. These guys are really, really well equipped to answer questions. What they don't want is stupid questions. Okay? So do your best to not waste too much time with them. But the more motivated they are to deal with you, the more patience they're going to have. Okay? And honestly, I think as we move down the road, we're going to make some videos to help bridge that gap in the knowledge a little bit. I would love to be able to go in and do some videos where we can really kind of expound on what are the offerings and what's what for what situation. Because a lot of times as a YouTuber, we get stuck going, oh, I'm going to install a, um, a tile in a bathroom wall today. And here's what I used. But that doesn't help you for, is it tile on drywall? Is it tile on a membrane? Is it tile on stone? Is it small tile, big tile? Is it natural tile? Does it need to be sealed? Is it a natural stone? Is it rectified? Um, what if I want to put it on the ceiling? What cement do I use for that? And what if it's glass? And what if it's a different thickness for my accent tile? And what do I do? There's so many questions, right? And you get lost. These guys can answer all that for you. But I think it's going to be good for us down the road. We're going to do more comprehensive training on the entire trade as a trade. I think that's probably going to be a big key. Mike wants to know, does shopping at a wholesaler work for small repair jobs too? Or do you generally have to buy in bulk? <clears throat> Well, that's an interesting question. So like, um, let's say, let's say you're doing a repair job and you need some specialty trim. Okay. You need, you want to, you want a few feet of baseboard. Okay. Um, I go to a place in Ottawa called classic wood moldings and I go in there and I'll talk to Frank and Frank is in the East end. He's a great guy. He's a carpenter. So he knows this, knows his trade, right? He's not just a retail guy. He's a carpenter. He knows how to bloody well install this stuff. And I've even hired him in the past to do stuff for me. But the point is this, Frank can sell you exactly three feet of a trim. He'll cut it right there on the spot. He'll sell it by the foot. Okay. And if you've got a weird, tricky situation, he can even sell you the, the special curved foam trim that looks like wood to go around that staircase, that tricky spot that nobody knows what to do. Frank knows his business. He knows if you need an inch and a quarter or two inch nail, he knows everything. That's what these guys bring to the table. They're trade experts. And a lot of them have had injuries or whatever, so they're off their knees. And they're taking all that experience and all that training and they're putting it in a store for you. So go take advantage of it because big box stores used to have a policy where they would hire trade pros to be in the store. Don't forget, you can do it. We can help. That's what they said. And they had plumbers and electricians and, and flooring guys. Now they're hard to find. Now most of these people working in the stores don't actually have any trade experience. And so there's not a lot of help there anymore. But uh, the wholesalers, they know their product and they know how to install it. Okay, let's see. Bum, 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 bum. We're getting back to the questions. Tim Leahy, hey Jeff, after watching the show last week, went to a flooring wholesaler for our basement laminate, saved almost a buck fifty a square foot compared to the Lowe's Home Depot. 
Now, hold on. So let's take a look at that. You saved a buck fifty compared to Lowe's. Was it exactly the same product or just the same thickness? Right? Because here's the thing. And I, I, it's apples and oranges, right? When you're looking at products, we have our, our buzzwords. Um, how thick is it? How wide is it? What's the wear layer? What's the, the, the finish on the top? Blah, 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 blah. And so we've created an economy where you have three or four talking points, and that's what you're comparing, and then it's by the price. But in a lot of cases, there's a lot of ways to get to the same quality of the talking points and still have a lousy product. So what I'm saying is whenever you're dealing with the box stores, remember, they got to pay for the parking lot and the advertising and everything else. They can't sell flooring of the same quality as a wholesaler does and be competitive. So if you're saving a buck 50, you might have the same product or you might even have an, a superior product for less money. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So good for you. And you know what a buck 50 a square foot is if you change your whole house over? Right? It's a few thousand dollars in savings. But you know what? You save the money, but the value of the renovation goes up as if a contractor did it. And that's the thing about contractor pricing. If 20% of the cost of material in a renovation is the norm, when a contractor goes shopping and buys that material for you, he's saving money. So he's really only spending 10 or 12%, not 20. And then they're still getting an 80% return on the average renovation on the valuation increase in your home, which is less than what you paid, which still blows my mind. But when you factor in how much taxation and meddling the government has in the process, and it's understandable. So when you do it as your as a renovator, when you renovate as a homeowner, sorry, and even if you pay the, the, the box store price and you don't know how to save your money, you're still getting a 300% return on your investment. But when you learn how to shop, now you're getting almost 400% return on your investment. There's not a, there's not a stock portfolio out there with any kind of, any kind of degree of, of, of comfort that you can guarantee that kind of return. But in renovation, 400% return on your investment every damn year? Like, you've got to be almost like stupid not to do it. <clears throat> One of the cardinal rules of investing is invest in what you know. Most people only know what they've been trained to do for a living. And there's no real investment opportunity there. So you own a house, learn how to fix it. Make that something you know, and then make a career out of working on that for the next 20 or 30 years. You're golden. You're going to outperform everybody. Housing outperforms inflation. Housing outperforms everything. Okay. Yeah, there might be some fluctuations and different markets have better and worse years. And the American market isn't as stable as a Canadian one, but that'll change. You know, you guys are still got a lot of room for growth. The average house in Canada is like 650,000 bucks down the United States last year. It hit 300 after 50% growth. There's a lot of room for growth down here. And I'm saying that policy and immigration is a huge factor as well as there's not enough labor. So when you have a labor shortage and you have a huge immigration policy, the valuations are going up. I don't care what anybody says. Now, uh, question here. Since Lowe's slash Rona, I'm reading, got sold, I purchased enough tools that went on clearance 90% off to start a side business doing repairs using your info. Good for you. I had no idea tools are going that cheap. That blows my mind. All I know is that a couple months ago, I went to return a tool and I didn't have my receipt. And Lowe said, we're not going to honor that return. You can't have your money back. And I said, well, don't want to just stick in the card and then you have proof of the purchase and that's all good. And they're like, no, we're not doing that anymore. And now I understand why, because they were selling. Yeah. Um, interesting. Hmm. All right, guys, let's get into the questions. If you got questions about your renovation, I'm open. Um, uh, what about power tools? and tools. Yeah, there's always options to get better price on tools. Here's the thing about tools. Um, let's talk what I know. DeWalt, for instance. DeWalt has more than one line of tool. Just like, you know, they have different quality of paints. There's different quality in tools. As a homeowner, you don't need the newest, latest, and greatest. You don't need a V60 or a V200 battery. Okay. The tools that they were selling five years ago were twice as good as the tools that were they were selling 10 years ago. And most homeowners aren't anywhere near competent enough to be able to handle a tool that was sold 10 years ago 
and get the maximum performance out of it. It takes years of training to develop the, the muscle memory and the speed and the reflex. So feel free to buy the lower quality tool knowing that it's still going to outperform your own capacity, right? Like if you're only playing street hockey with your kid on the weekend, you don't go out and buy a carbon fiber hockey stick that costs 800 bucks. That's for Sidney Crosby. So, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, yeah, everybody wants to know about tools. Look at that. <laughs> mm. I'll give you a hint. I'm working down here right now on a current project. We haven't released these videos yet. They haven't even gone to the editor. That's how new this is. I'm on a work visa down here in the United States. Okay. I'm doing some fun stuff this year. We're like trying out different kinds of construction styles so that we can help give more information to different kinds of markets. Okay. Right now I'm working on a double wide trailer. Oddly enough, it's like, but there's been a lot of demand for it over the years. So um, here I am renovating double wide trailer. I didn't have room to bring all my tools with me. So I'm buying them down here and I went to Harbor Freight. Yeah. If you're down in the States, guys, Harbor Freight. Listen, uh, you know, they're they're generally 10 years ago quality. But the bloody things work, you know? Like a, a jigsaw is a jigsaw. The blade goes up and down. It's really not that rocket science. You don't need the most latest, coolest jigsaw out there to cut a piece of wood. So it works out great. And if, you, uh, if you're if you a homeowner and you're only doing a couple of projects, consider not over-investing in tools unless you want to sell them again. All right. Here we go. Let's open this up now. It's six o'clock. We got some time. Let's talk about renovation uh, questions. Let's see who's out there that's got a question about their project and you want to get some information about it. Um, what different options are on the market? Like, for instance, let's talk about shower systems. Everybody's uh, heard of Schluter. That's the orange stuff, right? Yeah, it's because they, uh, they spent like billions of dollars advertising on HGTV. And now everybody's seen them. Did you know that there is probably, let me just guess, at the trade show, I saw one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I know personally of about 13 different shower waterproofing systems that are on the market that aren't Schluter. And they're all competing in the same space, but they're not marketing to you. They're just marketing to the contractors. So depending on what contractor you have coming to your house, you may not ever hear these names. And this is the way this works. Um, I'm going to be doing a project in this double wide trailer with a product you've never heard of before. And uh, that's cool, but you can have access to it and we're going to do it. Um, some really cool things coming up. Uh, did you know that you can actually do a shower with vinyl plank and you don't have to use tile? Boom, let me drop a hammer. Yeah, that video is coming soon. Um, are you still recommending ProSol for homeowners? I called the location in Saskatoon today. They said they only sell to contractors. <laughs> um, call back and ask to speak to the manager, Ryan, because uh, that's just a guy working there who doesn't know that they've changed policy yet. I'll tell you right now. I got it on good word from the guys that are selling to ProSol that they have switched their policy and they're opening up the cash sales to homeowners. So give them another try. Don't take no for an answer because that is ridiculous. And you know what? At the end of the day, if you have to, um, you can always set up a cash account. You know what it takes? Here's my name. Here's my address. Here's my phone number. Now sell me your product, please. That's all there is. And you pay for it before you leave. Traditionally, these wholesalers are set up so that they would offer um, two benefits. One, really good pricing. And they would offer net 30, which means you get credit. So you could... You could pick up your product, install it in someone's house, wait 30 days to pay for it so that there's time for you to finish the product, get paid from the homeowner, and then with the homeowner's money, then you can then buy the product because you're on net 30. This is actually a really good point. There's a lot of scams going out there right now in contracting where the contractors are like, oh, we need more money because we got to buy materials. If a contractor ever says to you he needs money to buy your materials, you just say, what's the matter? You got lousy credit? Drop the mic on them. You don't want to do business with a contractor that's got lousy credit. Because people with lousy credit in the contracting business are desperate. And that's dangerous. If a contractor wants to do business with you, 10% deposit is all he needs. That's a commitment that you're going to move forward. And then he should show up and he should buy that product from a wholesaler on credit. 
They give him 30 days, and then he should show up at the job site with his crew, install it, finish it, and get paid, or at least a progress payment, that he's completed work. Then he can take your money, once it's done, and go back and pay his suppliers. If anybody ever says, I need money in order to pick up supplies, they're lying or they're absolutely broke. And is that who you want to do business with? Free advice. Contractors have net 30 deals all over town if they're reputable. And if they're not, they need your money up front. Ha! Don't give it to them. Say, sorry, you can't come to my house. I'm going to find someone else. Because the stories are all over the place. People get started. They'll do some demo, they'll put a couple products in, they'll spend a couple hours here, there, boom, boom. Now they've satisfied the requirement that the law says, well, this is not a fraud situation anymore. This is a civil situation. This is just a contractual dispute. We don't want to get involved. So you're out of luck. I read an article the other day, someone out in uh, Vancouver, it was like 85,000 bucks they gave the contractor. He barely even showed up, had a couple of guys come a couple hours here and there once in a while. And they gave him money three times in a row for materials. Gah. Listen to me. If you're going to hire out, make these guys do the work first. They're not buying the materials with cash. They're buying it on credit. That's the whole point of the system. Okay. Whoa. <clears throat> uh. Okay, here we go. Uh, Paige's got a question here. She posted in the forum. Oh, yeah. You know what? I haven't got quite there yet, Paige. You've got uh, painter's tape, and it doesn't stick to the carpet to protect it. Suggestions? Yeah. Go buy yourself an edger. Get a six-inch drywall knife. Okay? If this is the trim, and here's your carpet, get a six-inch drywall knife. Stick it down there. Open it up against the carpet. Take your paintbrush. Paint your trim. All right? And then remove the knife. Boom. Done. You don't need tape. Tape isn't going to work. Tape is going to sit on the surface anyway, and you're, you're going to be all over cutting around tape and bumps, and it's going to look like gonna look like it's gonna look garbage so just take a six inch drywall knife or 12 inch drywall knife because that's about the size of a step stick it on there pull all the fibers down then paint let the fibers stick back in the paint it ain't gonna hurt if the carpet paints and gets stuck on the paint on the side of the trim but you don't touch it it looks perfect it's not gonna affect anything you'll be fine what's the best way to finish a step down in a sunken living room the best way well, it depends. Do you want to step down or do you want to level it up? You know, sometimes the best way is to put in a fake floor package and make sure there's no step down. If it's one step, you know, floor package is great. If it's more than one step, you know, then, then just a, adjust the fact that you're going to have steps. <laughs> I don't really know, Travis. I guess it all depends on the goal. You know, there's, there's really the difficult question with the best way or it's what's your goal? You got to tell me. If you're going to ask me a question right now, actually, here's the, here's the rules. Okay. If you're not a member, um, do super chat. If you're a member, ask a question, but tell me where you live and how old your house is. And then what's your goal? Give me a little clue. Cause I don't know if you want to renovate your basement so you can just, uh, you know, do some hockey practice with your kid, or if you want to put in a wine cellar and entertain down there, right? I mean, is it movie night or is it just a hangout? So there's a lot of different ways to do a lot of different things. Remember, we have a lot of different price points for houses and a lot of different price points for quality of product and a lot of different assemblies and processes for renovating the same space for different function. So you got to be a little bit specific with what you're looking to get out of it. Okay. Uh, we got a question here. I'm going to be doing a custom shower, 84 inch long, 48 inch deep. That's wide. That's a really deep step down. Eight foot walls. Can't find a floor plan pan large enough for those exact dimensions thoughts do i build it myself okay so here's the thing um yeah floor plans for floor pans are made that big okay you just got the wrong drain location so <clears throat> they make floor pans that are five and six feet wide and that is you know 60 inches is five feet so you can get 120 inch wide long that's not a problem the problem with you is you probably have a drain at one end and it doesn't fit the traditional marketing but there are companies out there where you can move your you can move your drain location to the middle and put in a linear drain and have two slopes coming off the linear drain that'll go the 48 inches wide no problem 
all of a sudden you've got a pan system that works. You just got to run a drain across the, the floor joist into a new location. Okay. So um, throw that question into the uh, forum and I will send you a link to a company that'll sell that for you. And then you are going to be just fine because you don't have to sit there and fuss around. And then by using a center line drain, you also don't have to create envelope cut for your tile. So you're going to have like four slopes. Okay. Which is key. So center line drains length or width make straight surfaces. So you can use large format tile on the floor and that'll save you a lot of hassle, a lot of aggravation and a lot of money because those small tiles for shower floors are usually quite expensive. Any idea how to go about removing a cast iron tub house is built in 1967. Cut that sucker into thirds. Okay. And here's what you do. You go down to the hardware store and this is where the, the box stores are convenient, right? They're convenience stores. So you, you have a convenience issue. You need a blade. It's called the cast iron blade. There's actually a sawzall blade or a reciprocator blade for cast iron only. And you can use it for pipe or for tubs, all right? And the key is take your reciprocator saw and press the, 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 the plate right up against the tub. And you can slice that sucker into thirds. It'll cut it like a hot knife through butter. No problem whatsoever. It costs about 12 bucks for the blade, but then you're good to go. All right. Come on, guys. Is that is that all we got tonight? <laughs> Give me a question that makes me sweat. Let's go. What's the best way to install tile when I only have half inch OSB subfloor? Would love to match height with three quarter hardwood in the next room. <clears throat> okay. All right, John. Here's where we're going to have to put you to work. Um, if you have half inch OSB. First of all, I don't believe that there is a manufacturer out there that makes half-inch OSB. To the best of my knowledge, the thinnest they make is 5 8 or it's half-inch particle board. So, A, what kind of floor joist package do you have? Is it 2 by 8 2 by 10 Is it 12-inch on center? Is it 16 or is it 24? B, are you sure it's half-inch? And C, um, where did John go? There we go. Um, if it really is half inch, surprise to me. Okay, next. Um, you can't put tile on to a half inch OSB unless you're 12 inch on center. And then you still have to use a crack isolation membrane like a Schluter Ditra, and then you can match it up. Otherwise, you got to remove the half inch OSB. Okay, and you're going to take your floor joist and you're going to add two by fours to it, five eighths of an inch down, and you're going to laminate those. And then you can put subfloor in between all of your floor joists. Okay. And then you're going to add another 5 8 subfloor on top of that. Or sorry, another, like, so you're going to put the 2 by 4 and then you're going to put in 5 inch subfloor to go flush with your floor joists. And then you've got a 3 quarter inch gap that you can work with. And you can use Schluter um, Ditra XL and then tile and go flush with your 3 quarter. Or you can put in a half inch subfloor at that point and then still add the regular Ditra. These options are all up to you to figure that out. But double check, because I really don't think there's half inch OSB out there. Agnes wants to know if she should install an Ikea kitchen directly on the plywood subfloor or on top of new glue down vinyl. I haven't done the glue down yet. Uh, yeah, put it on top of the vinyl. It makes it sexy, right? You don't have to use quarter round trims to cover anything up. Uh, glue down vinyl doesn't expand and contract, so just go for it. Not an issue. The only time you really want to worry about putting something on top of flooring is, um, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a fan of doing it on top of hardwood. Okay. Just because hardwood has a propensity to getting wet and damaged and expands and contracts and it warps and you can't really refinish in a kitchen situation quite nicely. <clears throat> but most people are looking for the look more than they're looking for practicality. Um, but in your case, with a glue down vinyl, no worries at all. You can put it on top of that any day of the week. It's very industry standard. All right. Cheers and good luck with your project. Woo. Mark has a question. Is it worth trying to reuse framing lumber? Moving wall 24 inches as part of a bathroom reno. It'd be great to just move the studs, top and bottom plates, et cetera, if possible. Townhouse in North Virginia built in 99. Um, yeah, why not? Take a saw blade, right? And and cut through all the nails where the joints are and then just relocate it. That's that's not the end of the world, right? Uh, you can always screw it all together after the fact. 
Um, I don't have a problem with that. If it's in good shape, reuse it by all means. Lumber ain't cheap. Um, you know, the funny thing is years ago, I went on vacation. I was in Dominican Republic and I noticed that uh, the people down there were doing a lot of exterior work and parging and stucco and stuff. And, and their scaffolding systems down there were really creative because they had, they had a variety of these thick scaffolding boards that were all different lengths. And what I saw was they would put it up, they'd nail it down, and when it's done, they'd, they'd take it off the nails. And they would do that so often and reuse that same board so often that the end of the board would start getting all splintery. And, and then they'd just cut a couple of inches off, and then they'd just have a shorter piece of scaffold for the next time. <laughs> like Those people recycled because they didn't grow trees to cut lumber from, and lumber was premium. So they knew how to work with it over and over and over and over again. So yeah, when I mean when a, when a two by four was a buck fifty, people threw everything out. But now that they're five bucks, yeah, by all means, go ahead and reuse it. Wood will last a good hundred years or so in a house if it's in a decent environment. No sense throwing it out. Starship dude, now there's a name, right? In Kansas City, Kansas, that's usually where you find it. Looking to move a laundry room in the basement so it is separate from the bath would mean digging up the concrete to move the washer drain. Worth trying to DIY. Well, that's an option. The other thing you could do is you can move it and then you could throw in a pump system to re-divert the water so you don't have to open the floor. Um, yeah, and as far as like opening up the floor and putting in a drain system, it's not that tricky. Just make sure you're using a two-inch pipe because that's a new code for laundry drains. Um, you know, you can, you can open up a floor hole and you can move things around and you can add the right slope and you can backfill with some crushed stone and you can pour in your own concrete. These are all skills that you are more than capable of doing. The only thing you got to do is make sure that you get the permit, you get it inspected and that uh, it's signed off on the work so that you're not going to run into trouble. All right. And that's a piece of cake. And if you've got questions about the design, once you've opened up the hole, you can take a picture and we can, you know, send it in to me and I can say, yes, you use this plumbing fitting, this plumbing fitting and, and I can approve your design, okay? That's I can I can at least help you that way. Can't help you dig a hole, but I can at least approve your design. All right. <clears throat> Ryan wants to know what's the best option to flatten the basement floor before putting down the subfloor. So you got a four inch drop over 16 feet. Pour concrete or scribe pressure treated wood. Better option. 1924 house, no water issues. Okay, so a 1924 house, you got a four-inch drop over 16 feet. All right. Um, oh, 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 oh. You know what? Here's, here's, this is going to be totally out to lunch. You're not going to like this answer. Um, why don't you bust out the floor? Because it's only going to be about an inch and a half or two inches thick anyway, tops. It's not that big a job. Regrade it, put down a vapor barrier, and then pour a new concrete floor. Because there really is no way to do it right. A 1920 floor, you don't want to put wood down and then a subfloor system with sleepers. That's a lot of organics. You don't have moisture control. You know, and you say no water issues. Uh, yeah, good luck. 1924 with no water issues. You know, um, I'm not going to go to Vegas and put a million dollars on black. You know, that's just not going to happen. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to suggest repour the floor or at least call somebody up who's got like um, a company in town that can do a uh, gypcrete. It's a gyp rock concrete. It's much easier flowing and they can pour that in like a floor leveler and then you can work on top of that. That's another option. Okay. It doesn't, you don't have to use concrete on top of concrete. You can use gypcrete. I don't know what the price is going to be like in your neighborhood, but it's something to consider. But DIYing your own sleeper subfloor system that's just a nightmare because every one of those cuts has got to be sealed and it's not going to be pressure sealed. It's just going to be paint sealed. It's just really not ideal. Wow. The other thing you can do is you can just change your flooring option because four inches over 16 feet. I know it may sound dramatic, but the truth is it's not. So maybe your best option is just to go put in a carpet floor and move on with your life. Like, I don't know why so many people are so fixated with having a flat level floor in a basement. It's not a place where we need to spend a lot of time and money and energy to try to make perfect. It's a basement after all. So um, you'd be surprised if you're just throwing a carpet, you might be like, well, that was the best damn decision I ever made in my life. All right, let's go. Good day from Toronto. 
one of my current rehabs in Gary, Indiana. Okay. Shh. Are you on a work visa? Albrick, like your background. Do you recommend any sealer before insulating then drywall? Um, no. And I'll tell you why. I'm a big fan of letting your wall assembly, and that's everything from your exterior facade to the paint on the drywall, everything in between. I want it to be able to dry in both directions, okay, whenever possible, especially in older homes. So as soon as you come in and say, I'm going to stop the drying process at this point or at this point, you, you, you cut the ability for the house to defend itself and dry out in half which is why I'm not a big fan of vapor barriers and basements, but it's part of our building code, so we gotta bloody well do it in Canada. But generally speaking, um, sealing up your masonry, which is in the middle of the assembly, you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna stop the migration of water, which is the drying out process. And you can really cause problems. So you gotta really stop and think through, how is this house gonna dry? What's the climate that I'm exposed to? What's the soil conditions and, and the plants even around the house? You got to look at all of this stuff to really figure out, do I have the right system here or am I trapping water? All right. Wow. In a lot of cases, if you were just to insulate one inch from that wall with a rigid foam, it's almost non-permeable, you know, give or take. It's on that pretty 90% product. And then let that airspace maintain itself. You're going to get the same barrier protection against moisture coming into the house, but you're going to allow that building to dry and you won't run into trouble. Okay. Um, oh, Metalli. Okay. One question, replacing copper to PEX in the entire house. You've used the antenna grounded to current copper pipe. What is easier? Get rid of antenna or add proper grounding? Um, first of all, Grind, grounding the wire in the house is actually simple. There's a metal plate. It's about this big, okay? They, they dig a hole outside the, and they shove it in the dirt. And there's a cable, a, this is a copper cable wire that comes from that and goes in next to the electrical box. That's the grinding, grounding process. It's not that tricky. So if you want to get rid of all the copper in the house, you can actually just put in a brand new grounding plate and run the wire in from there. You don't have to rely on the copper for the grounding. It's actually a better system than the copper pipe. So you can remove all of it altogether, okay? So you don't have to rely on any old technology. Cheers. Um, wow, here we go. Kenny, wow, what a cute picture. Kind of looks like me as a kid. 1987, Minnesota home remodeling bathroom, freestanding tub in the shower space. How can I waterproof around the freestanding tub drain? Let me get that again. Remodeling a bathroom, freestanding tub in a shower space. That's a nice big space. How can you waterproof around the freestanding tub drain? I am totally lost, Kenny. Like in my understanding, you know, the, the tub is a dedicated drain system. There's no waterproofing needed. But if you have a drain in the floor around the tub, it should be part of a like a shower system. Six by seven feet. Yeah, you should already have a, a waterproofing system for the whole wet area. So if you have a big room and you put a tub in it and there's a drain, you're not looking to waterproof around the drain. You're looking to waterproof the entire floor, okay? Like it should be like a, like a shower system, whether it's a roll-on or a membrane or something. But you want to have that waterproofed. Um, and, and that drain should be there for just for the occasional overflow or something. But you don't want water coming overflow, soaking through your grout, getting caught underneath your tile, and that not have a waterproofing membrane there. That would be potentially very detrimental, okay? So at least get a roll-on on there that goes up to the drain. I would prefer an actual physical membrane, um, but that would be the best plan. Okay, cheers. Oh, wow. All righty. Hey, Brian, cheers, man. Thank you very much. <laughs> That was funny. Look at that. Number one. Imagine that. All right. Um, let's just try to stay. Oh, there, Joshua. Did I answer Joshua's question? Okay. Joshua says he's got uh, subfloor three-quarter ply going to tile large format. 
Will Schluter Detra eliminate the need to build up floor and nails, noise and wood? Will screw cock also? Okay, so if you got a three quarter subfloor, whether it's OSB or plywood, you can go with Schluter Detra as a finish. If you've got at least 16 inch on center floor joists, and for me, it's a two by 10 floor joist. I don't like two by eight, but in the literature, it says it's okay, but for me personally, I, like, I, don't, I don't like it. I think you still need to add more layer. Now, three-quarter plywood is better than a 5-8 OSB, so you're probably okay even if it is a 2 by 8 floor joist, but the point is this. Um, whenever you're doing this, always screw down your subfloor before you put in a membrane, okay? Because squeaks happen from deflection. There's always deflection on a plywood product, and it, the noise is always going to be there even after you put in the membrane if you don't screw it down, okay? So give your subfloor a little bit of help. Screw it down, then add the membrane, and you're going to be just fine. But make sure that your plywood is also clean and then dry before you put on your thin set to add your membrane. Because if it delaminates, then the strength of that entire system is gone. So you can't afford to have dirty plywood or dusty plywood when you add your membrane. So make sure you wash it and let it dry thoroughly and give it a good vacuum before you put the membrane on. Cheers. Okay. Previous homeowner built a deck with no spacing between the boards. Should I rip it all out? Or run a circular saw on the seams to create the gap. Whew, that's a bold concept. I mean, wow. I guess that all depends on on a few things. Um, one, how how good are you with a skill saw? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, dude, that's uh that's potentially gonna look like like really nasty. The other thing is, is how close is it to the ground? And what's their soil conditions and where do you live? Because if it's close to the ground and you don't have good airflow underneath, whatever you do, the wood will continue to expand if it's in a high humid environment. So maybe the best solution for you is to um, uh, change the boards over and seal the bottom first so that they're not soaking up or wicking up moisture all the time, right? Or move to a, um, move to a composite product that doesn't have the same expansion contraction issues, all right? Yeah, it all depends on the airflow and where you are geographically, how much rainfall you get every year, all that kind of jazz. There's so much going on there. Wow. Ah, Naveen, is, thank you. Cheers, by the way. Planning to convert unused basement stairs to a small bathroom. Where to start? Floor and structural. Planning to convert unused basement stairs to a small bathroom. Okay. Wow. Huh. Hmm. Start with sending me pictures. You remember, send me pictures. Let me have a look at the space. Um, and in that, in that comment, when you send it to me, I want to know the age of the house and where you live. Because I cannot comment on how to start a basement project without knowing your geography and the age of the home. Because there's a lot of technology going at play there, okay? I uh, appreciate the love and getting your question up here, but that's where we got to start. Because I could send you down the wrong path real quick in a hurry and you could have a disaster without me knowing the right information. And I don't want to do that. All right. Okay. Vinny. Hey, Jeff. Home from 60s in Northeast Pennsylvania. Okay. Basement walls are cinder block and painted areas are flaked. Guessing from moisture pass through. Yep. Have a dehumidifier, but any concerns? Dry lock question mark. <coughs> okay. Well, Here's the thing, Benny, um, cinder block walls, if they don't have a waterproofing barrier on the outside of the block, then the moisture is going to come from the ground and it's going to go into the masonry and then it's going to keep on passing through to wherever it's dry. And inside your house in Northeast Pennsylvania is heated. So it's going to be drier there in the winter time than it is in the dirt. And so that moisture is going to work its way through that paint or the dry lock. I don't care what you put on there. Okay. You can't build a submarine in your basement with paint. It ain't going to happen. Moisture is more powerful than any kind of paint on the market. So forget the concept. The only thing that you can do to keep moisture from moving from wet to dry is to put in an exterior membrane. So you can roll it on the outside. But if you roll it on the inside, it's going to come into the block and it's going to go up into your framework and it's going to rot out your joist package and your rim joist. So that's not what you want to do. Don't trap moisture heading in one direction only. Get it on the outside. Trench your house if you want to and waterproof it there. 
or don't do any of that mess. And then when you finish your house, leave an airspace and then insulate on the inside of that airspace, like a, like one inch rigid foam, use a dab method with the adhesive, right? And maintain that airspace so that the moisture can travel through, find that airspace, and then it can travel out through the house and you control how, what that, what that looks like over time. You don't want to trap moisture if you can't stop it from coming into your house. You have to find a way to let it dry out. That's really the key. If you can keep it from getting in, then you can manage your moisture that way. But once it's into the structure, you've got to manage how to get it back out again. And that is a completely different deal. And there is no um, foo-foo dust. There's no magic for that. It, it's just good old-fashioned physics. All right? And if you try to solve a problem with physics with chemistry, you generally just change the definition of the problem. Does that make any sense? Physics is more powerful than chemistry. Okay, that's the that's the association that people, you know, homeowners especially, got to get this. The world is is fascinated right now with using new products, and they're all chemistry based to solve old problems. But physics is stronger than chemistry. Okay, it's like kung fu. It's good. It works. And as soon as you want to rely on a on an adhesive or a sealant or a chemical or a caulking to solve your problem, you've reduced yourself to the installation of that product and the integrity of the installer and, and the, 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 the durability of that product to withstand long term. Whenever you're dealing with physics, you win every time if you got a good physics solution. So be careful with that. Um, house from 80s, 90s. Okay. Stereo wall 206, OSB, I guess break, my mic. Window taller and narrower. Any advice on what I should worry about the most? Oh, yeah. Well, if you want to make a window in, a, in an exterior wall narrower, then you're fine. Because you don't have any structural issues. Because every every window that's in a house that has any structural load has got um, something on the top of the window that transfers load to two points on each side of the window. So if you want to make it narrower, you're automatically fine. Now, if you want to make it taller, you might have to take that load transfer and raise it up the wall. Okay. But that's not a real big issue. Um, there's nothing really there to worry about. But if you're gonna if you're gonna move a load bearing structure like a like a, a, a like a beam above a window, then you have to temporarily take the load off that wall in order to restructure your wall. So you're gonna want to get a structural engineer in there, and they can draw out the the design and the schematics, and they can take into account the load of the house and and the floor joist package and all that kind of jazz. And they'll give you a strategy to be successful because every house is a little unique in a lot of cases. And you want to have somebody out there who's got the science and the math and working all that physics out for you so they can come up with a plan so you can be successful. It's going to cost you about 1500 bucks for that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, 1500 bucks, or you might be stuck in a position where your temporary wall snaps and then you're holding up the house by yourself and you're going to lose. So, uh, it's definitely worth it to get a pro in for that. <sighs> Nick, chemist here. I know you're right, but boo. <laughs> you know, Nick, there's a lot of room for chemistry in building science. But um, let's not start with it, right? Let's solve the majority of our problems with physics, and then we'll use chemistry to button it up. You know what I mean? That just makes good sense. Like, let's try this. Let's put a roof on a house. Let's invert it. We'll put all the water to the middle. And then we're going to trust a, a asphalt sealant to keep the water out. Even a chemist would tell you're an idiot, you know, put the roof the other way and let it all walk, flow off the side. Use physics to solve your problem. Um, <laughs> yeah, cheers. Uh, Trek fighter. It's got some prior water damage above the basement bathroom that has a drop ceiling. Utah, any first thoughts? Wow. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, above the basement bathroom that has a drop ceiling. Prior water damage. Well, if you've got water damage above a basement bathroom that has a drop ceiling, in a lot of cases, it's another bathroom that's above it. So first thing is first, take out the ceiling tiles and have a look with a flashlight. Follow the water back to the source. Because every every time there's a water damage, there's a there's a there's a there's a source and it leaves a stain and you can just follow the path right back to where it came from. And if it's a, if it's a, a, a bad joint at a drain or, a, or an elbow somewhere, you'll be able to find it and fix it. And then you can reinstate. It shouldn't be an issue. Um, 
Okay, Robert is putting an addition on a house. He's told that costs a lot to haul away dirt to expand the basement. <clears throat> Recommendation is to go with crawl space. Any thoughts? <clears throat> wow. You're told that it costs a lot to haul away dirt. Okay. All right, well, let me, let, let's just talk about this real quick. Um, yeah, we got more. I'll take one. If you're going to um, do anything with heavy equipment, your, your best bet is to uh, Google owner operator of a dump truck. Um, find somebody or a company that uh, you can rent the, the equipment from that you can, you can remove the dirt and put in the truck. Generally speaking, an excavation company, you're going to find somebody out there who can do it for you. And you know what? The, um, the equipment and the labor, um, you know, generally speaking, these guys can dig out a hole for a basement in one day. So they're going to show up around 6 o'clock in the morning. They're going to take off their, their equipment, and they're going to have two trucks working back and forth, maybe even three. And, you know, like you're going to be dealing with paying five guys a day's labor, plus your heavy equipment rental, plus your dump fees. And if it's decent soil, they'll probably have a hookup for a free place to dump it. Lots of guys out there looking for clean fill for free. So, you know, if I had the ability to say, would I want a, a dugout basement or a crawl space on an addition? Robert, I don't have an answer unless I know where you live. And what's the purpose of the, the addition? Like, let's, let's focus on that. Because if you're getting an addition, you had a purpose. Was it you needed square footage for like a living space? Or are you looking for um, just growing the size of the house for the purpose of the value of the house? And do you need storage, right? Hey, perfect, thanks. Um, it's really, it's a cost-benefit analysis. There's no right or wrong answer. There's, I would say the majority of additions that are done on a house for the sake of getting one more room, they do not dig out. Not where I'm from. It's four season climate up there. Almost all of them are done on some kind of a um, uh, helical pile, okay, uh, or form or something like that with an engineered floor truss. So that's just how it's all run. But, uh, oh, okay, here we go. Trek fighter saying the drop ceiling issue is, is basically gone and there's no vent for steam. Okay, well, if you've got, <laughs> if there's no ceiling there, then put in a, put in a fan. <laughs> Right, you can run it right out through the rim joist, a four-inch hole. You can drill that in a rim joist, no problem at all. You don't. It's not a structural issue. Drill through, put in a four-inch line, and get a fan in there. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, uh, narrow, tall window. The beam stays the same. Top of the window does not move. Oh, you're worried about thermal and vapor insulation and brickwork. Sorry for spam. Finally, I was able to catch the live show. Thank you. All right, here's the deal. Uh, if you have brick on the outside, you're going to need to get yourself a mason. Um, again, it's a window, so you can you can lower the brick, you can lower the sill. That's not even dish, an issue because again, you don't have structural load on the brick, right? And if you're not moving the header, then you don't have structural load on your interior members either. So you go ahead and resize that all you want, and you're just going to hire a mason to come out there and cut through the brick line, take some extra bricks out, flip them around so that you can have the finished half bricks exposed and not the cut exposed, and make sure that they're um, they're giving you a quality job. Okay. All right. Um, we got a 2016 bare basement in Massachusetts. Cheers. 6.30. After framing an electrical, would you recommend a contract and spray insulation or roll out yourself? All right. Here we go, guys. One more time. <clears throat> spray foam is amazing. It's also very expensive. And it is not remodeling friendly. So if you're thinking of ever doing anything in the in the future don't use spray foam the best place for spray foam is a cathedral ceiling okay or in an attic space where you're not going to renovate that space everywhere else i'm not a big fan of spray foam because somewhere down the road what it does is it triples the cost of doing the renovation and why would you want to do that to yourself or somebody else um there's no real significant benefit on a 2016 house of spray foaming one, one area, right? Cause you're just doing a, a bare basement. 
and then you're in Massachusetts. It's not even all that cold, to be honest with you. Yeah, no. I would, uh, for insulation, I would go with a rigid foam and then a frame in front of it. Um, a rigid, yeah, rigid insulation board, sorry. And then frame in front of it and then just fill with some bats to get up to your whatever your code recommendation is for Massachusetts. I don't know if 10 is enough out there or not. It'd be interesting to find out if anybody knows. Um, Joel wants to know if you hire a contractor to do a kitchen renovation and they have to go to supplier for cabinets, are you stuck with that or can you have the freedom to choose a different supplier? Well, Joe, here's the deal. Most of these kitchen companies that are out there get a distribution deal for a certain cabinet company or two or three, okay? And so you're working with them because part of the price that they're giving you includes the profit margin and the fact that they're negotiated a better price on the cabinets than what they're selling them to you for. That's the deal. So you're buying $20,000 in the cabinets and, and they're buying them from their supplier for seven or eight. And the difference is their profit and everything else is built into that system so that they can make a living. And if you want to go to a different cabinet company, then you got to, you got to pay him to do the install because he's also got that eight to $12,000 of the profit built into the supply on that cabinet built into his formula for success. So if you want to change the cabinet supplier, you got to change your, your, your contractor um, or have the contractor get a distribution deal for the other cabinet company. If it's available, Depends. There's like regional territory issues. Why do you think there's like 45 kitchen cabinet companies and only really two or three companies that own all of them? It's so that everybody can, can get a distribution deal in the same city from the same cabinet company. They just have 12 or 15 different design names for it. So they have competition against each other inside the same town. It's just a mess. But yeah, if you want to change that, you're going to have to get a new contractor in most cases. Okay, Robert said he bought a 1.4 square foot ranch, taking down a foundation and building a 5,000 square foot two-story in its place in New Jersey. Our forever home existing base was 800 square feet. Okay, so that is a really big deal. Okay, so 2,500 square foot versus 1,400. You're looking at 1,000 square feet of crawl space. Yeah, Um Robert, depending on your water table, here's the deal. If your water table isn't that bad and you're going to put that kind of a, a project together, you're going to find that a thousand square foot extension, depending on your soil conditions, may be precarious. Okay. Helico piles have a lot of inherent problems if they're not done right and you don't manage the water after the fact. More warranty claims come from helico piles for homeowners who don't manage the water runoff from their buildings. And that ends up like irrigating out around the helical pile and things sink and move and crack. And so if you're going to go that major of a, of a renovation, I would say get the basement. Because when you go to sell, people are going to be like, well, that's weird. You know, half of the house doesn't have a basement. And what you have is you have two building structures attached together. And you're trusting in the science. And there's nothing wrong with the science of using helical piles and all that kind of stuff. But eliminating that this is going to react different than this in the same kind of conditions. It's, it's a real peace of mind. So for me, um, if you're in New Jersey, you're going to go to a 5,000 square foot house. And if you're planning on doing any of this kind of work as a DIY, you're going to do some finishing or something, you're going to get equity there. Or if you're just managing the project, then you're not going to go over budget doing that. Dig it out. That's what I would do. I would dig it out. Yeah, I'd put in the money. Because the other thing is, is you're going to get 2,500 square foot of basement, right? And that is a real attractive feature to the next buyer. Whereas 1,500 square foot of basement, after all your mechanical and everything else, hmm, that's not terrible. But it's not a lot of storage space considering a 5,000 square foot home is usually for a pretty big family, right? So you know, there's a lot of pros and cons there. The other thing you could do is ask a real estate agent if you should have an agent all right, and find out what the comparables for the home with a basement or versus a crawl space are and see if there's a cost benefit analysis that you can actually say, hey, that actually makes sense to dig that out because we're getting the same value back. It doesn't cost us a dime. Or maybe it makes you money to dig it out. So check that out too. Uh, AJ, 97 double wide. 
There you go. Cheers, buddy. Mm. A nine-foot foundation. Well, that's big. North Missouri. The furnace pulls cold air through the basement door. Okay. Should an exterior door re replace it? Well, if you're pulling cold air through a basement door, um, and you, you, you know, like, holy cow, you should have an exterior door on. You, know, you need air seal. You need gaskets. The question is, if it's pulling that cold air through, is it because you don't have enough cold air return in the basement right now where there's like increase in pressure? So when your system turns on and off, does it pop? Does it make noise? Or does it go, poof, right? Are you creating a vacuum system in your cold air return where it's like sucking and sucking and sucking and it's literally pulling the door open to let the cold air in from outside? If that's the case, you need to just add more cold air return in your basement to get, alleviate that pressure, okay? Because, you know, a basic door or the basic gasket should stay shut. And if you're sucking your door open, then you probably just need to add more cold air return to your system. Uh, hello from Ottawa, Canada, South Keys. Wow. Cheers to the Keys. All right. Tom is in Indianapolis, Indiana. Single story, 850 square foot home with a crawl space. Sounds about right. Is there any easy DIY system you'd recommend to add in-floor heating in between the joists in the crawl? No. It's a bad place for the heat. You don't want it in between the joists and the crawl space. You actually want it above your subfloor in the home. Okay. So you're heating interior of the house. You're not heating in the crawl space. But if you end up heating the crawl space, you're going to get very little benefit actually entering into the home. All right. So get it on your subfloor. Um, there are all kinds of systems out there for uh, vinyl or laminate or hardwood or tile. So if you got questions about each of those specific situations, what kind of flooring you want to put in your home, hit me up and let me know. But there is, there's electric, there is uh, in-floor water radiant. Um, you may not find a lot of value there, but for electric heating in a floor, it can, it can do really well for you. Okay. And you'll be surprised um, the difference it'll make having a heated floor in your home, right? You'll be able to drop the thermostat down like significantly. And save yourself a ton of money down the road. And uh, generally speaking, electric floor heating, it's not that expensive. Relative to the benefit of not feeling cold all the time, getting rid of the drafts in the house, it's pretty awesome. I think you probably end up saving money investing in it. And then when you go to sell the house one day, you'll be like, yeah, I've got heated flooring. And then be like, whoa. Ho. So you'll get great buck for it, right? It's, it's definitely electric is the way to go. Jeff, can I use semi-rigid ductwork for an island vent? Uh, hood having hard time getting, uh, yeah, the riding ductwork in from Texas. Rigid, rigid ductwork in from Texas. Semi-rigid ductwork. You're talking about the aluminum that um, is flexible, right? Not the plastic. Uh, yes. Now, that's assuming you live in Ontario. <laughs> John, I don't know what your building code is like where you are from. Um, the reason they want rigid ducting is just because of the risk of uh, uh, of grease fire, right? And they want to make sure that you've got a material there that's going to at least provide some protection from en engaging the wall cavity of the home for a certain amount of time. So the best that I understand that the, the, the semi-rigid is still acceptable and shouldn't be an issue. We use it for, um, we use it for venting uh, gas fireplaces and um, stove range vents all the time where I'm from. So unless your code is different and I'm not familiar with it, it'd be worth a Google search to check. It should be fine. Mm. There's a lot of hood vent products out there that you can't even install without using the, the flexible ducting. Just the nature of the install. It's just crazy. Tim wants to know, would you tuck tape a vapor barrier under laminate for basement laminate or just leave secure unsecured? Do you also secure first straight row of floating floor? Okay. Um, basement laminate. You want to seal the vapor barrier to itself for the entire surface of that floor. You do not need to tape it to the concrete at the edges. It is just to stop the direct transfer from the concrete into the laminate. All right. But if you tape it on the overlap, then it'll make sure that it doesn't get kicked apart during installation. You don't want to have one spot where there's a big 
hole in the in the vapor barrier. And because if the middle of the floor gets a six inch mold spot on it, the entire floor is garbage, right? So that's why we tape it all together. It's just to seal it up to make sure there's no direct transfer. Um, Sandman, we're Wisconsin, 80s house. Any concerns converting the bay window to exterior French doors? No. No, and I'll tell you why. Because when you add a bay window on a house, okay, the the framework that's carrying the load is still going straight across, just like it would a French door. And everything you add to the outside just complicates the, your water diversion system. So getting rid of that whole window thing will actually, it'll make your house more energy efficient because it'll be a lot more efficient to have a straight wall with a door than a bay window because they never do insulate well. And they're forever getting wet and getting moldy and getting drafty and not being insulated well and inviting mice in and everything else. They're just horrific, to be honest with you. Most of them are built wrong. Most bay windows are not built integrated into the home structure, right? Continuous, they're just added on after the fact. And so they're just horrendous, most of them out there. It looks pretty and they're just built all wrong. It's like putting a screen door in a submarine. So yeah, go right ahead. Uh, your structure is already intact. You should have a header. And as long as there's enough gap between the bottom of the header and the floor that if it's a standard door, you can just get one off the shelf. If not, consider this. It's probably cheaper to buy a custom-made patio door that fits inside the dimension of your framing than it is to get a structural engineer out and go through the trouble of lifting up the header and redoing the ex exterior facade. Okay. Sometimes if you're going to go from a $1,500 patio door to a $3,000 door because it's custom, it's worth it because the engineer is the difference in the cost and you don't have all that extra work to do. Okay, cheers. You're going to wait six to eight months for it, but that's, that's, <laughs> you're going to save some money and a lot of aggravation. All right. Uh, okay, guys, it's quarter to seven. We're going to be wrapping up in about 15 minutes. So if you've got a question, get it in here. Um, Jaden Hudson, 1967 house in the... UP of Michigan. I'm going to say the upper peninsula. I don't know. The upside, the top of Michigan. Exterior walls are two by four. <whistles> yep, that's about right. Insulation is basically non-existent. Well, energy was so cheap back then, they would just crank the heat to uh, 110 degrees in the middle of the wintertime, and who gives a rip? Uh, it was only 10 cents a month for it, right? Uh, what's your opinion of services that inject foam into the wall so I don't have to tear everything out? <sighs> um, instead of foam, I would go with a loose fill, blown in insulation. And here's the thing, careful on the cost. Because when they fill that up, it's all going to settle. You're still going to get drafts all around the top of the wall. So it's not going to make it incredibly warm. It's just going to, it's just going to help out a little bit in the, in the short run. You'd be surprised how easy it is to remove the drywall on the exterior walls and put bad insulation in and then just add your own drywall after the fact. Cost effective, I think a DIYer who learns how to do their own drywall work and reinstall the same baseboard trim because you're not changing the thickness of the wall. You just pop your baseboard off, remove the drywall, insulate it, put two new 12 foot sheets of drywall on. Most rooms aren't wider than 12 feet. It's not this tricky as you might think. And, um, you know, it's only one wall in every room that you have to do. So generally speaking, it's not a bad gig. Um, if you blow it in, you're still going to have to drill holes. You're still going to have to do patching and repairing and drywall and mud and sanding and painting. So most of the work, scope of work is the same. If you put in bat, you're not going to have gaps. You're not going to have drafts. So I would say, I would say, uh, no, it's only drywall. Don't be afraid to tear some out. All right. Oh, look at this. STFU. Question, 12-foot galvanized carport panels. Do I really need two-sided urethane tape in each panel? Seam. Can I get away with just screws and grommets? Wow. Well, if someone in the manufacturing of that product is suggesting they use a two-sided urethane tape for each of the panel seams, there's a reason for it, and I'd follow the recommendations. I'm not familiar with that product myself. Um, hmm. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Sorry, dude. Uh, you got me on that one. Send me a send me a question and send me a link to the product. I can take a look at it, and maybe we can help you out with your assembly. Um, there might be a recommendation there for thermal versus non-thermal situations. That's the best I can think of right now. Um, there we go. Okay, so 
big fan of your work. You're in Oshawa and want to find out where you can get a house plan from. Did not get one from the seller. Okay, well, uh, it all depends on the age of the home, but generally speaking, anything after 1940, 1945, the city has them on file. They should have record of all the house plans. So um, it's not like the government with taxes after seven years, they throw everything out. Um, the cities actually hold on to this stuff. It's all archived. So if you just take your address and call them up and say, hey, um, yeah, there should be, uh, they're almost like a librarian working for the city who's got all that stuff, maybe even on microfiche. <laughs> and for all of you that don't know, that's like, that's like a really old school way of having pictures on a reel that goes into a box and you stare at it and you slide the pictures by and you can find your pen. Yeah, it's crazy. Our technology's changed a little bit. I don't know if they've updated all those files on a computer or not, but uh, they should have something there. Unless your house is older than that, then you're, you know, SOL. All right, next question. Where? Where are we here, buddy? Oh, <laughs> Uh, maybe I do need to buy my glasses. Gary's got a 1980 home. That one definitely has a plan registered with the city. Um, basement floor is partially tiled. Okay. Can I put dry core tiles over top of the ceramic tile or do I need to tear it all out first? That's a brilliant question. Um, masonry on masonry on masonry. Uh, who gives a rip? You're just going to be a little uneven, right? So you're going to have a bit of a bump there going from the tile to the untiled, but because it's all masonry and none of that is going to be, it's not organic. If you trap any moisture in there, it's not going to cause anything to go moldy. I would say, uh, don't worry about it. If you don't feel like ripping it out, then don't. All right, Mike, 2005, North Carolina. Is expansion foam legit and a closed gap between bottom plate and slab from settling in one corner of the house? Between the bottom plate and the slab. Okay, so Mike, if you're on a slab and your slab is actually cracked and sunken a little bit, and your question is, is it legit that they can drill holes in the slab and inject foam and lift the slab up till you got your wall and you, you and you want to and close that gap? Yeah, you're damn right it's legit. They do it with garages and stuff and slabs all the time. That is actually a legitimate thing. Make sure the company you're hiring has been in business for a while and has got some great ratings. Okay, and then... Um, you want to say, you want to talk to somebody who had a slab issue like yours that they've fixed. Okay. And that's all you got to do. A little bit of research, but the concept is legit. It's a real industry and it's growing. So don't be concerned about that. 1950 home in Concord, North Carolina. What's with North Carolina represent tonight? Unfinished basement, crawl space floor is still dirt. Okay. How far should I go to fix it? <laughs> well, let's see. <clears throat> 1950. <sighs> Basements or slash crawl space have weeping tile. Usually it's clay tile, kind of like um, a California roof. It's a bunch of like half tiles stacked against each other to allow water to travel in one direction. Um, tree roots and time usually destroy those things and they stop working. So... The first thing you got to find out is, does your wall have wet spots? Get a scope in there and find out, is your weeping tile intact? Um, and then, are you planning on putting any kind of waterproofing in there? But then, ultimately, how you decide if it's worth spending the money on it is, what's the purpose of the space you want to finish? If you just want it as a hangout, you know, you can get away with it. You can just go... Leave it as a concrete and, and paint it. Paint that every five years, you're fine. If you want to make it a lot more comfortable, then, then throw up some rigid foam and frame it and leave an airspace so that it can dry out as it goes. But, um, and then the floor is still dirt. How do you go to fix that? Well, you're going to want to pour a floor. Like, ultimately, you want to pour a floor, right? You, there's not a whole lot you can do with dirt. So, um, if it was me, I would just pour the concrete because what they'll do is they'll have a truck come up and they'll just pipe it right in there, okay? And they'll have a team, like three or four guys, wheelbarrows, and they'll just fill them up and they'll all walk to the other side and they'll dump it out and someone will rake it. Uh, a good concrete crew can do a basement like that in, in an afternoon without any difficulty. So keep that in mind when you're getting quotes for pricing and stuff. 
could be a DIY job, but that's hundreds of bags of cement you got to mix by yourself. So consider that. <laughs> Cheers. Alex has got uh, oil heat in Massachusetts, again with the Massachusetts. It's very regional today. It's interesting. Finishing the basement and trying to seal the room for sound, but no near eats airflow. Yes, it does. One slotted door off to the side enough, or do I need more airflow? Okay, well, here's the deal. Um, generally speaking, you want to have a six inch round cold air return for every, I'm going to say, three to four six inch heat sources. It's a forced air, but it's not operating at like, you know, 50 miles per hour wind pressure. You know what I mean? It's pretty passive. So um, if you have a slotted door to one side, you should be fine. Here's the thing. <sighs> You're sealing the room for sound. I know. <sighs> you can't have it all. You're forced air. You got to have cold air return. The other thing you can do is um, you see, take a look at putting in like a cabinet somewhere, like a dry bar, okay? And then underneath the cabinet where the toe kick is, right? Put in a really long grill and then open up the drywall in the backside of the cabinet so the air can be passing through there into the next room as well. That's a great way to really cheat. And it's hard for sound to really do much from that because the cabinet ends up soaking up a lot of it too because it goes from a small space and then into a wide space and right and so that's pretty effective it's a good cheat all right um i need my next question here oh I don't know. Uh, here let me just have the mouse here and i'll just I'll let you go do what you gotta do hey all right oh here there's a great question Okay, I got two great questions in a row here. What do I feel about glazing a shower tub? I love the idea of a tub. Showers, no. I actually called a glazing company in the Orlando area to ask them about my um, shower tub because I was thinking that'd be a great video to do, show people how it's done. And the guy was like looking for 1200 bucks to glaze a tub shower combo. But uh, I sent him a picture and he was pretty convinced it was only plastic, so there wasn't going to be a warranty on it. And then after I told him, ah, that's fine. I'll, uh, I'll do another option. I can re-shower. I can put a new shower in myself for less than that. He came back and he was offering me the contractor price of 900 after two or three phone calls. It was amazing how fast he changed his price. Here's what I think about it. A tub should cost about 300 bucks. A shower tub should cost about five. Half the work is just getting there and showing up and setting up and cleaning up the equipment. All right. So can we stop ripping people off to do a tub shower, please? All right. Um, what was your worst day on the job? I hate to set the market price or anything, but like seriously, you're going to do two jobs in a day and it's an employee and you're going to charge 2,400 bucks for that one guy to go out there and knock off two jobs. He's going to be done by 2.30. Give me a break. Anyway, what was the worst day on the job? My worst day on the job. I don't even have a worst day on the job. What? Did I ever have a bad accident or anything? I'm just trying to think. I'm going to get back to you, C-Dolphin. I'll, I'll formulate the answer to that one in a minute. All right. Um, okay. <laughs> Easiest way to get permits when you DIY. Do I need a plumber or electrician before remodeling the kitchen, bathroom, and removing a wall? Okay, so no. Um, a lot of districts allow homeowners to get your own permit. Okay? And it really simplifies the process because... Um, like where I'm from in Ontario, and I know this isn't Bible, but this is you know, it's somewhat standard practice. A, 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 a building officer will say, okay, so you own the house, you're getting the permit for yourself. The work is going to get inspected and here's your inspection schedule. They want to know this, this, and this, and this. And then all you got to do is hire, you know, qualified trades to do the work for everything you're not going to do up to code. That's fine. Um, the permit is like a couple hundred bucks, but as soon as it goes to a third party, which is a contractor's pulling a permit for you, they have to then hire someone who's got um, certification to draw. They want drawings. They want like maps of the house, interior, exterior. They want everything for yourself. You know, you can scratch out what you're doing on a napkin in a lot of cases, but as soon as you get the pros involved, the permit goes from a few hundred bucks to like five to $10,000 in costs for all these trade pros. And it is extreme. So if you're going to get a permit, consider doing it yourself. 
it's, it's, it's really quite the process. They really tighten the screws on the industry pros to make sure that they're, you know, doing all of their due diligence and getting them all of their paperwork. And they're creating an industry where one doesn't really need to exist. Um, oh, hey, cheers. Welcome to the uh, membership program, Snack Boy. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. The worst day. There you go. Flying, stinging things. That's great. Um, worst day on the job. Uh, it would have been the farmhouse when I lost my crap and I treated my son like crap, to be honest with you. But that was, uh, that was my worst day. Yeah. That's actually on video too. That kind of sucks, but Hey, it's out there. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't mind getting stung by hornets, but I don't like treating my family bad. That was a bad day. Can you explain the memberships briefly? Um, the fact that they're all different, it's just up to you to what level you want to join. At this point, we just, we did four because we had people who wanted to bless us a ton and people that just needed to have access, want to support us a little bit. It's all good. It's up to you. Uh, down the road, we're going to start working this year. Actually, we're focusing a lot on a membership program and how to deliver better value and different options and different tiers. So we'll develop that a lot as the time goes along. And that's all good. Ah, but basically, um, right now, whatever level you join at, you get the same benefits. It's just up to you. And so that's what, what that is. Uh, Joe, uh, is it better to build a new detached garage with traditional lumber or use those modular steel frame garage kits? Northeast U.S. climate. I haven't decided if I want to use to insulate or not. Depends on the cost. The answer to that is all about your neighborhood. If everybody else has a, a like a detached garage that looks like the house and then you don't, it, it might be a um, it might be a selling factor issue. Um, but generally speaking, if you've got enough dirt and you can put up a steel one and you just want a place to have a place to work on your car or something, then yeah, rock and roll. Um, it's all good. Here we go. Uh, this guy says, I'd take time off work and work for you for free for the opportunity to get yelled at and learn something. Yeah, but father-son dynamics are different, right? Like, you know, I got to be, I, I can't just go full Gordon Ramsay on the guy, right? You know, that's not going to work. Ah. Speaking of, if I uh, bought a house and I, I brought a bunch of you on as an apprentice for a month and we did like a contest and uh, we would, uh, we would, we would, we'd put you through a bunch of skill training. You guys all renovated the house and at the end of it, maybe somebody won the house. Does that interest anybody? Let me know. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Uh, yeah, get yelled at by Jeff. What an, yeah, what an honor. Look at this. They're actually buying this, man. I mean, maybe I'm too easy on you. <laughs> I man, everybody likes that idea. There you go. And if you don't show up early, you're late, you're fired. How's that? Yeah. Wow. What a difference that would be. <laughs> Gordon Ramsay meets a tool belt. That'd be funny. Um, not where it snows. Definitely not. <laughs> there we go. Well, guys, listen to seven o'clock. I'm just throwing that idea out there. It's uh, something we're toying around with. Logistically speaking, it's almost a nightmare, but we're, we're getting there. We, uh, we got our business plan put together. Now I got uh, everything in place. I'm down here in the States on a work visa. We're still working on some insurance and licensing issues and that's all good. Um, uh, uh, yeah, if you want to know about a good size and budget for a DIY garage, two car garage with a living space, um, anywhere from 30 to $180,000 is your budget. It really all depends on your fixtures finishing. That's what it all comes down to. Um, this has been great. I hope this helps. I hope my chat in the beginning opened your eyes to some possibilities. Don't be afraid to change your spending habits and consider this. <sighs> the best stuff that's available out there for you to work with is not going to be in your face. You're going to have to go and look for it. Okay. It's like fish. If you want fresh, you got to get in the boat and catch it your damn self. All right. Cheers till next time. Um, we're pretty much out of here and uh, love y'all. Thanks for coming out. Good to see you again. We're going to do this again real soon. And because uh, we're going to do a lot more live shows on a regular basis. So uh, pay attention to the homepage. We'll advertise the next date. Should be in a couple of weeks. All right. Cheers to next time.